Yes, seems to be working. Okay, it is my great pleasure today to welcome Professor Stefan Schmidt from the University of Vienna in Austria. So Stefan uh, yeah, is a, a very uh, versatile person. He, is, he did his PhD in Switzerland uh, under supervision of uh, Roger Battenhofer in Zurich. And then he traveled through several positions all over Europe. So uh, he was in Germany, in Denmark, in France, in Belgium. And finally, uh, he, he landed uh, in Vienna. So very recently, he got uh, ERC Consolidator uh, grant about uh, self-adjusting network. And uh, that will be the, the topic of his talk today. Stefan, please. Thank you very much, Sebastian. So if you have any questions, please say it loud. If possible, because I cannot see the chat um, here right now, so that, that would be great. Good. Um, so as we know, a lot of us use uh, data-centric applications a lot these days related to social networking, uh, business, science, gaming, etc. And a lot of these applications use the cloud. Okay, and it's distributed applications, so traffic in data centers are growing a lot. Okay, so this is one of the big data centers, that's Alibaba uh, data center. And um, the network there become a critical infrastructure of our digital society. But the problem is that um, this infrastructure is growing a lot. So network equipment uh, is reaching capacity limits. So transistor density rates are stalling, power density rates are stalling. And um, they also call this the, the Moore's law of networking that is uh, slowly ending. Okay, so switches um, don't become significantly faster over time like in the past. So this means we need more equipment, uh, larger networks, and this is very resource intensive. And actually that's um, quite annoying for companies these days, but um, it's a nice opportunity for research, I would argue. So this is one of the, the pictures I got from Microsoft here. Um, so the, the gigabit per second um, per euros over time is uh, not growing as fast as it used to be recently. Um, so one of the root causes why these inefficiencies there, I argue, is the way we build the data centers today. Um, so how, how do we interconnect racks or computers in data centers today? Um, there are many different flavors, but all of them have in common that um, they are fixed and oblivious to the traffic demand. So this should denote here a network that's like a tree, a fat tree. Um, there are hypercubic networks, um, other types of interconnects, but all of them have in common that they are oblivious to the traffic. And this is a little bit like building a highway that um, you don't account for the actual traffic. So here uh, in the morning, perhaps there is a lot of traffic going uh, to the city and there is traffic jam, while on the other side, there is a lot of capacity available. Uh, it would be much better if you could, of course, use these lanes as well here to make the, the highway demand aware somehow. Uh, maybe in the evening, it should be the other way around. Um, and um, if you ignore that demand, it can be quite frustrating uh, that it, the infrastructure is not used uh, perfectly. So our vision here is that the network should become more flexible and, and demand aware. And um, the way you can think about it, and this is one of the technologies there, uh, this is a, te a projector a technology that's developed by Manya Gubadi at uh, MIT. Um, so you want to have a flexible interconnect. So one way to do it, you could have mirrors at the ceiling. And um, for example, if there is a traffic matrix or demand that is as follows, that um, rack one needs to communicate to rack five, rack two needs to communicate to rack six, rack three to seven, etc., cetera, then um, it could make sense to interconnect the network so that it matches this demand. So here, uh, the first rack is connected to the uh, number five, two to six, three to seven, four to eight. And um, so basically have direct connectivity between the, the, the racks. 
uh, maybe later the demand changes. It could be like that, that one communicates to two, three to four, uh, five to six. So it would be nice if again, we can reconfigure the interconnect the network and uh, so that it matches the demand. So that's uh, basically the vision uh, of self-adjusting networks that um, we are changing the topology, the network towards the, the, the actual demand that it currently serves. Um, just a little bit of empirical motivation. So there is uh, empirical studies showing that there is a lot of um, structure in the traffic. So traffic matrices are sparse um, and skewed. So these are traffic matrices between uh, RECs in, in, in Microsoft and in Facebook that you see that some of them communicate much more often than others. Some of them uh, receive a lot of traffic. Some of them send a lot of traffic. A lot of pairs don't even communicate uh, at all. Um, traffic is also bursty over time, so we need to adjust it over time as well. And our hypothesis here is that we can exploit that structure. Or that's our goal, basically. Um, the vision sounds uh, crazy, but there is enabling technology for that. It's based on photonics. So channel photonics is one of the enabling technologies um, or key enabling technologies of our future prosperity, both uh, considered in the EU and also in the US. Uh, there is also this saying that, that the photons are the new electrons. Uh, and this is only one of, I think, five, yeah, one of five uh, technologies that are considered uh, enabling for our future. And more specifically, the enabler here are um, optical switches or reconfigurable optical switches. Um, that are currently developed by different research groups and teams around uh, the world. Um, I will not present those in details. If you're interested in these optical reconfigurable switches, um, have a look at our um, ACM SICOM workshop program. So there is a workshop called OPTIS that ran uh, last year and also two years ago that um, people are experimenting with different technologies, uh, digital mirroring devices, uh, there is also a company in uh, California that uh, um, has a prototype with, um, with spinning disks that you burn some matchings on the disk. And then if you spin the disk, you can uh, change the physical topology based on that. Um, based on changes in the voltage, you can also uh, reconfigure it. I think one more example is the optical uh, circuit switch. That's um, um, the idea here is that you can, uh, again, quickly adapt the physical layer. Um, but rather than, for example, moving lasers and changing the, the direction of lasers, um, the idea here is that you can basically uh, change the mirrors. And by changing the mirrors, you can also um, change the interconnect. And moving mirrors is usually much faster than uh, moving lasers. So for example, if uh, traffic uh, light um, path come in uh, to the optical switch like this initially, and the mirrors are located like that, then, um, for example, the light path will be as follows. But um, if you rotate this mirror that is basically on, on motors that can be changed, then um, you can also change the um, topology or the, uh, the matching that is implemented by this optical switch. Um, so the big picture of this project is that on the one hand, we get these uh, flexibilities of the technology, these new enabling technologies, optical technologies. And um, there is also a lot of structure shown in empirical studies in the traffic patterns. So that the idea is really to exploit that technology to serve that structure better and by that uh, improving the efficiency. So that's the idea of the self-adjusting network. Um, so we are mainly working on the theoretical foundations and I want to show you a bit uh, what's behind the, what's the theory behind self-adjusting networks. Um, also maybe one remark that um, the position here is uh, of course uh, quite um, well aligned with other trends we currently see. So there is a lot of self-adjusting systems there, for example, algorithmic trading, there is software that adjusts to the the current uh, stock market. And uh, there is, of course, a recommender system that adjusts to your uh, preferences, uh, give you better recommendations. Neural networks themselves can be seen as self-adjusting networks to some extent. Uh, our focus here, unlike these others, is mainly on the, by focusing on the hardware, uh, self-adjusting systems on the hardware level. OK, so um, a lot of self-adjusting systems today are in software. 
Um, so one question is, so basic question, how much structure is there in the traffic and how can we actually measure it? And uh, I will first talk a little bit about that and then I will show you how to algorithmically exploit it and also discuss a bit the challenges that are there still. Um, so we have quite a good intuition today. When is traffic or what does it mean uh, traffic has structure or not? So these are two traffic matrices here or demand matrices of um, GPU to GPU uh, workloads. And um, this one on the left is more uniform and the one on the right is more skewed. So these are like um, source destination pairs and each color is one source destination pair. In this case, so we have four to four GPUs and um, each color is basically one communication pair. And intuitively, intuitively, we would say on the right, we have more structure because um, this uh, one GPU has significantly more incoming and more outgoing traffic than the others. So that is, um, for example, the parameter server in this application that is uh, more involved in communication. There's hardly any peer-to-peer -peer communication here. So if you have this traffic pattern here, obviously there is more structure that you can exploit for optimization. So maybe here it would make sense that this parameter server or this GPU is um, located or connected better than, uh, for example, the interconnection between other GPUs is less critical. Um, so if you have any questions, just um, speak up. So um, also over time, uh, we have quite a good intuition, I think, what is um, more structured and less structured. So if you take this traffic matrix again, the skewed one, um, when you observe the traffic pattern over time, so here is a, a plot over time, um, each color is again the corresponding color here in the, in the traffic matrix. So this is just a spatial distribution, spatial structure. Then the observation is that there is still quite a bit of structure over time because here we have a lot of red, later we have a lot of blue, and before you have a lot of blue, then you have a lot of yellow. So that's uh, still quite structured over time compared to the lower one. The lower um, sequence uh, over time is exactly adding up to the same amount of colors like on the left. So it's giving the same traffic matrix. But here we generated it um, at random. So here the, the structure over time has been removed. Okay, so although they are um, giving the same traffic matrix, we would say that the upper one is much more temporal structure. So how can we um, quantify that systematically? So we, we built a theoretical framework that allows to uh, measure or identify and distinguish between different um, dimensions of structure. So if you take the original um, traffic trace, so these are source destination pairs, time is going downward. So first this communication pair is there, then the next. So this is how they communicate over time. So in order to, to measure how much structure is in this uh, specific traffic trace, um, we developed this approach that is based on um, compression and randomization. So what we do is um, in the first step, we randomize the rows. So we take this original traffic trace and now we just put each or permute um, these rows at random. So each source destination pair ends up at the random position here. And um, then as a second step, we randomize it even more. We just take a completely uniform um, uh, assignment of sources and destinations to this sequence. And the more we go to the right, the more we randomize, the less structure there is. So basically, we systematically remove structure in that trace. And the more we go to the left, um, we have more structure. So um, the idea is that we can exploit this to measure how much structure is in the, in the specific steps of the, of the reduction. So here, by doing this randomization of the rows, we remove temporal uh, structure. And by doing a uniform assignment, we also remove the non-temporal structure. And now the, the key idea is that if you look at the original trace and we compress it, we use, for example, lampot sif to do a compression of this trace. We put it in the file, we do a compression. Then this most likely will compress to a much smaller file than if we have a more random uh, trace. So this trace uh, may result in a bigger file if you do if you compress it. If you do more randomized, if it's completely randomized, then it's not possible to compress it. 
at all. So most likely it will give us a, a bigger file. And then we can uh, measure the differences between these uh, sizes in order to, to see what's the amount of structure that has been lost in this step. So the difference in size, the different entropy is um, a way for us to measure how much temporal structure has been in this original trace. And uh, in the second step, we also remove the spatial structure and that allows us to measure how much um, spatial structure has there been in the original file. So by just um, comparing the file sizes and basically that the compression approximates the entropy. So this is the approximation of the, of the information content there. And if we do these two steps, um, we get amount of temporal structure, we get amount of non-temporal structure. And um, the idea is that um, given these two dimensions, we can basically see for different traffic um, uh, sequences, where do they end up on a two-dimensional space? By the way, as a side remark, these were just two steps, but we could do multiple steps and other types of randomization to find other types of structure there. So this is just the basic ones, temporal, non-temporal, but we could subdivide them uh, based on sources, based on destinations, et cetera, more. So this is basically the, the general framework that, that allows you to, to identify different types of structure also. So in this map on the upper right, so on the, on the x-axis, we have the temporal structure. On the um, y-axis, we have the non-temporal structure. And something on the upper right, so towards the right and towards the upper part, the, um, the, the complexity increases and the structure decreases. So complexity is just the opposite of the structure. So that's why we call this the complexity map. Up here would be completely uniform traffic. There's no temporal, no non-temporal structure. Down here would be the skewed traffic that has a lot of spatial structure, but no temporal structure. And up here would be something with a lot of temporal structure, but no uh, spatial structure. And uh, here in this corner, of course, would be both. And the file, the size of the disk, you know, is like the file size after compression. And we just plotted um, existing traffic traces in, in networks. And you see that um, you can make two main observations. Maybe first, um, all of these uh, traffic traces that there are out there that we use for the measurements like machine learning, high performance computing traffic, um, different traffic uh, sequences from Facebook data centers, um, some uh, synthetic traces that people are using a lot in the in the SICOM papers, PFabric, neural network traces. All of them have different structures and none of them is really fully uniform. So actually traffic really has structure but different applications have different trade-offs of structure, temporal and non-temporal structure. And um, the vision is that we, can't, we want to exploit that. So today's data centers, they are built more for the upper right, for worst case type of traffic. But um, since there is so much structure, maybe so much structure like this neural network, um, we could exploit that. If you could build the, a network that is optimized for that, then we could have a huge gain. Maybe we need much less infrastructure to serve it. So that's the empirical motivation there that um, we are considering with different traffic traces. So this is mainly focusing on high-performance computing and data centers, but of course the methodology would apply to any type of traffic the trace that you can have. Um, so what about the now exploiting this structure? So how can we um, adapt a, a network to this structure. And um, also here in our current understanding of uh, how this should be done, uh, entropy and information theory uh, plays a, a big role. Um, like we used to characterize the traffic uh, structure before. And maybe to give you some idea, um, well, and, and what is our idea so far is that um, we can exploit some of the connections here in the algorithms to algorithms that exist in the context of data structures and also coding. So traditionally, if, if you build a communication network, um, it's uh, usually built for worst case uh, properties or worst case metrics like diameter and degree. Okay, so if you, if you want to have a constant 
degree network, then in, in graph theory, uh, it follows that your diameter in the network will be at least uh, logarithmic. So you cannot have a, a constant degree network that has a diameter less than log logarithmic. So traditionally, these kind of metrics are uh, considered there. Um, if you make a network, if you want to make it demand aware and optimize to the spatial structure, then um, there is a first step of doing that. You can make this statically. And um, the second step would to make this even dynamically, because as we've seen that the traffic also changes over time. So that's what we call self-adjusting networks and demand aware networks. Um, there are two flavors, static one and, and dynamic one, and um, we are interested in both. And the more you adjust the network or the more fine-grained you adapt the network to the traffic, so the lower will be the routing cost, hopefully. But then, of course, at some point, you pay some reconfiguration cost in, in addition. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you say uh, self-adjusting networks, uh, you mean uh, that uh, you can uh, adapt dynamically the edges of the network? Right, exactly. But so basically, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. And my question is, could you possibly add or remove some uh, nodes depending on the demand? Is this something that could so be... So now it's only edge-based. So currently only... So basically the, the, the nodes here represent the switches. Mm -hmm. data center routers and um, they have some uh, certain number of um, links that they can choose to which they connect to okay so for now it's only changing the links you cannot remove the entire node or something like that because that's a hardware that you need to buy and the only um, flex you can think of it like lasers you have maybe three lasers on each of these vertices and you can choose to whom you uh, connect them of course you can turn them off and then you have an isolated node but it's never uh, benefiting uh, you if, if you if you remove it completely. And mathematically speaking, could we envision to add or remove some nodes? Because uh, for some use case, for example, assume that your nodes are, uh, say, a, a container or something that you could create or remove because this is virtual. Uh, is it something that your model could uh, consider? Um... I think the kind of metrics that we currently have, I would have to think how to extend them if you have uh, the possibility to, I mean, for the metric side, no, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, algorithmically, if um, some of the nodes um, additionally have the flexibility to remove them. Um, so, so first of all, I, I don't know that the scenario in which this is currently interesting. Because if these are virtual machines, I don't know what is the cost, for example, of a link. So why would I not be able to have like more links or, or things like that? But let's say it would be a peer, a peer to peer network, right? The peer to peer network can also be uh, maybe self adjusting in this sense. So in this, in this case, it become more virtual, that's right. Um, but then if, if it's a node that has any, so usually each node has some source of traffic and some destination of traffic. Mm -hmm. So uh, then, of course, you, you cannot remove it, otherwise your cost will be infinite. But um, I mean, basically in our network, the, the nodes are also source and destinations of traffic. Yes, for so, example, uh, you could imagine uh, uh, logging systems where you have uh, horizontal scaling, for example, and where you can, for example, add uh, dynamically uh, uh, workers to handle uh, more events, for right. example. And Actually, so, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, actually, now uh, when I think about it, so what, a little bit in this direction, we actually already, already exploit it, as I will show you in a second. Because um, in, in this context, even in the physical context, that what you're saying is actually can be interesting. Because there, um, we will see in a second, but basically you have a traffic matrix that is sparse. And then not all of the nodes um, are really needed, um, needing all their connections in the network. And then we can launch these additional nodes to help other nodes uh, have a low degree and still have a short path. Okay, so there are, um, in our algorithm, actually, we exploit the presence of some additional nodes that are not strictly needed or they don't need their full capacity. And then we use them to help the other nodes um, connect at short path uh, with a low degree, but we never completely have isolated nodes. But um, so, okay, so the short answer in our model, it's not needed. Um, if you have a good use case for this, I, I would have to think uh, how to adapt the algorithm. But actually, I think it's 
it um, could be quite straightforward to support what you what you want there. But it's like uh, because we, as you will see, we build this up on data structures, and also in a data structure, it's never like you remove a node because you don't need it or something. Because each node is really needed, because it can be the source and the destination for communication. But if you um, if you have a, um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't. I, in in our case, the problem is that um, you will never. It's never possible to have less nodes than the traffic matrix. Because if you um, if you have less nodes than traffic matrix, you may have some disconnected nodes that are not. Uh, um, maybe let's let's talk later about it in more detail. No problem. Because it's like we cannot do an embedding here. Because what you are asking goes a bit into the direction of also like virtual network embedding and so on. And there is actually quite interesting connection uh, to this problem that I will tell you about. But uh, here we don't have the option to emulate other like source nodes on one other node or things like that. Because each node is really a physical node that um, has traffic. So um, we would have to formalize the, the model before I can fully answer it. OK. Good. Um, but you will see it in a second, I think, that the limitations of, um, of being able to address your uh, model. Um, so the more you adjust the network, the more you tailor it to the traffic, then um, the more you can optimize it. So in, in the following, I, I mainly focus on routing cost. Um, but similar benefits, you can also have it in congestion and, and other types of metrics. But uh, for simplicity, uh, in the following, I just consider the, the number of hops um, that packets need to travel in your network. And um, so there is a similar world to, to our vision here, and that arises in data structures and coding. So I will just give you one example, binary search trees. So in a binary search tree, traditionally, what you try to optimize is the, um, the depth or the balance of the tree, right? That um, once you have a logarithmic access cost, you are usually happy. Uh, because if you don't know the access pattern to your data structure, then uh, log n cost is just perfect. But um, if uh, there is this notion of a biased binary search tree or demand aware binary search tree that um, if you know the, the demand pattern, the distribution of your um, key popularity, then you can optimize your uh, network, your binary search tree towards that even more. And uh, there is also this notion, uh, maybe some, some of you know, the self-adjusting uh, binary search trees, or for example, uh, splay trees, that even adjust over time. That the data structure, if uh, something become more popular, then it um, automatically removes the, moves them closer to the root. So, um, oops, if you, um, um, and actually something similar happens in, um, in coding. So if, if I want to communicate in a language with someone and I don't know the, the distribution of the letters in that language, the best I can do is log n bits per letter, right? So this is like worst case coding. But if I know the distribution of the French language, then I have some distribution. So I can use, for example, Huffman coding and uh, have shorter codes. Uh, potentially, depending on the distribution. If it's skewed, I can have even more short codes. And if um, the language changes over time or the popularity of the letters changes over time, I can do something like dynam dynamic Hoffman coding that um, I adjust the coding to the current popularity of the letters, uh, even dynamically. And um, the more I go to the right here, the, um, the, the, the better become the access cost in the data structure and the shorter become the codes in, uh, in communication, in, in information theoretic terms. And um, so there is something called dynamic, dynamic Huffman coding there. And the cost on the worst case uh, binary search to your coding is log n. What's the cost of serving um, patterns that you know the distribution? It's um, proportional to the entropy. So that is classic results that then the um, per letter you need a um, entropy amount of bits to encode it. And there is also something called entropy rate that is like uh, entropy over time. And that's kind of the ideal um, compression that you can have here. And um, our vision is to do something uh, very similar in the context of networking. And actually we already showed um, that entropy is also a good metric here uh, in the sense that in a classic com communication network, if the degree is um, constant, then uh, you have a logarithmic diameter. But if, you're, um, if you can optimize towards the traffic matrix, we have shown that something like entropy is also here. So basically the, 
entropy of the demand matrix of the traffic matrix um, gives us the, the number of hops on average or the expected number of hops um, in, in a network that the, the packet needs to travel. So if you have a very frequent communications, then the path will be shorter if you optimize it. And if you have longer paths, if you have less frequent communication pairs, then the path can be longer. But overall, you, you manage to achieve the entropy. And I will show you in a second um, the idea here. And then something um, analogous uh, we also want to do in the dynamic network that become um, even proportional to the entropy rate. But there it is the question, how do we model the reconfigurations? So um, actually, we, we could show that both lower bounds from the data structures and from the coding can be used in the context of networks as well. We need to adjust them a little bit. And, uh, but also algorithms, we, we believe we can use algorithms there. But uh, maybe I should say it right now that we believe entropy is quite a good metric here, but in general, we are not quite sure entropy is the right metric in this context. So we could prove tight bounds so far just for sparse communication patterns. We don't know how to characterize the, um, the root length, for example, in, um, in general traffic matrices where uh, traffic may not necessarily be sparse. So sparse, I mean, if you have an n times n, uh, n sources and destinations, so n times n communication matrix, only n or O of n many entries are non-zero which is often the case in practice, so communication is sparse. For this case, entropy is good, but we don't know what's happening in general. Okay, so that, let me just give you some intuition here. Let me watch the time. Um, so this is our basic- Can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, about this uh, uh, notion of entropy and entropy rate, I mean, I'm used to that for, uh, for I mean, uh, sequences, right? But what is the, on what, what um, say, stationary sequence do you compute an entropy rate? I'm not sure to understand this. Right, so that is, um, um, let's get to the rate. I mean, so basically, so far we are kind of uh, in this area, still with the entropy. So entropy rate is something that we uh, know from the compression. So we need to have a stationary distribution and things like that. Um, this is kind of the vision that we are mm -hmm. on, but we have not made the match here yet, okay? So um, this part, we know how to okay. characterize this, the transition, this is like the vision that we are slowly moving to. So there are still some question marks there over there, indeed. I will show okay. you the- So but the sequence would be- okay. the, the sequence here is like the, 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 the um, uh, pairs of communication partners, uh, see, uh, right? So it's like uh, this source communicates at this destination, mm -hmm. at this time, this amount of bits, and then the next pair and, and so on. I see. And so this is this would be your stationary sequence of traffic and you would extract, extract an entropy rate from this uh, stationary process. Exactly. Assuming and, you see traffic yeah. as the stationary. Right, it's like imperial, all of this is okay. by the way. And what you say. Mm -hmm. By the way, all the en entropy mm -hmm. I mentioned here is, is basically uh, em empirical entropy. So it's like the entropy is based uh, on the actual traffic traces for, for now. Okay, and so the, the general idea is that from this uh, stationary sequence, you want to define um, uh, an entropy rate and then a coding which would translate into a structure, into a, a topology right. for your routing, uh, um, uh, net for the the uh, adjacency graph of your uh, routing, right? So That's right, exactly, like that. exactly. Okay, okay, thank you. And that should be um, our constraint here is that um, these networks, there should be constant degree uh, for scalability. So here the degree is always uh, not arbitrary, but we want to have a fixed number of uh, connections there per node. So just um, to give you some idea of the basic problem or one basic problem is you have this uh, sources destination and you have a joint probability distribution or this the traffic matrix is um, probability distribution. This is a static optimization problem where some pairs one and three communicate a lot. So darker means more. It's like one out of 13. And then all of this add up to one. So this is joint distribution. 
And then, um, for example, three communicates a lot to seven. Uh, there's no communication between two and six, etc. So then it, we want to build a network that um, minimizes the expected route length. So that means um, the distance of the corresponding two nodes of the demand. So this is the demand. This is the physical network that we built. The distance um, of the, in this network between U and V times the probability of this pair appearing. So we want to make a weighted optimization of, the, of them. So um, in our case, in this example, the degree is free. So each node is allowed uh, only to have three lasers, let's say. And um, uh, for example, if you have much traffic between uh, four and five, then uh, it makes sense maybe to add a direct link there. If um, now, for example, we have um, uh, node one uh, communicate to many destinations, right? So it's quite a popular uh, a source node then um, you cannot connect to all of them directly. So to some of them, you need to connect indirectly because your degree is bounded by three. And uh, for example, it, sometimes it, you can even have a, a physical links between two nodes that don't communicate. It, it can still make sense because maybe that link is a, is a good relay for other, uh, for other communications. So here over, over there in this model, um, we do the multi-hop routing so we can uh, use that link. Uh, it's, uh, if the optimization problem model is not clear, just um, let me know. So now the, I want to show you this connection in the static network um, to um, the entropy or to the data structures or the coding a bit more specifically. So if you have this uh, traffic matrix here, then um, what um, uh, you could do, for example, if you just focus on one source, and uh, you look at the distribution of the destinations um, just for this um, source. Then if there would be nothing else, then the optimal um, constant degree network, or let's say the, the optimal binary network or binary tree network that you could build for that source um, would be a Huffman tree, right? So this a single row is kind of a classic optimization problem, a coding problem where if you build a Huffman tree, then you get um, you get the optimal um, code length for the corresponding source. So here, the more frequent elements will be closer to, so up here will be four, and then the more frequent elements will be close to four, and then the less frequent ones will be lower down here. So that's why this color uh, range. And we call this uh, con construct the ego tree, because this is like um, um, a constant degree network or let's focus just on binary trees because it's, it turns out not to make a difference in the asymptotics. So if you have a binary tree optimized for this uh, single source, we call this an echo tree because it's just optimized for four. And um, now what we could do is we could just um, do this for every source. So we could build the optimal binary tree or biased uh, binary search tree or biased Huffman tree, Huffman tree for one, for two, for three, for all of them. And um, if you take the union uh, of those trees, then the, um, the degree of some of the nodes will be no longer uh, constant, right? But um, for the lower bound, um, we can still exploit this lower bound of the data structure of the Huffman tree, because we know what is the, the expected uh, cost or root length on this tree is like the entropy of this row, right? Sorry. So what is the optimal um, root length of this tree is the entropy of this row. This is the entropy of this row. So if you add this all together, you can transfer the lower bound from this coding to the expected path length of the network itself. Okay, so if you take the union of those, it's no longer a constant degree network, but the lower bound of the entropy still applies to the, uh, to the whole matrix. So it will look a little bit different here because here you have now the, um, the conditional entropy. So if you want to do this for a matrix and not just for a row, uh, you need to take the weighted um, rows here overall. So it's not just the entropy of a single row, but it's the entropy um, of the destinations given the sources, plus the entropy of the sources given the destinations. And I, I have a, sorry, I have a question. Uh, if I understand well, in your Huffman tree, uh, so you will uh, find the code for each destination of uh, the network. Right. 
but uh, what does guarantee that uh, in each of man tree, the same code uh, denotes the same target nodes? Um, so, so here I organize all of the, um, the nodes of this row according to the Huffman tree, right? So all of these nodes appear in this tree. And you were saying, what was your concern that what if, if a node is zero, it, it, there's a destination zero here or? Yeah, my question is how do you define the union of uh, those uh, 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 trees? Because uh, the code of each node might change depending on the tree that okay. you consider. So, okay, so maybe, um, first of all, here we're only talking about lower bound. This is not for constructing a real constant degree network. This is just to get the lower bound from the Huffman um, context to the network context. So uh, if you take the union of these uh, trees, um, what, what we get is a network, right? And uh, if a node appears here and it appears there, then it will just be have both of, of the corresponding links, right? So you just um, take the union of all these links uh, in the individual trees, and that gives you kind of the overall tree. Now, uh, it doesn't have to be a coding anymore, right? Because what we want to construct with that is actually a graph or a network. So here, um, the, this, this, this resulting network is used for routing and not um, for coding. Maybe that, um, what was that the confusion? Because um, for us, it doesn't matter if the same node appears here and there, uh, because in the end, we don't need the um, a coding or something like that, because we want to just build the network that has short paths between the frequently communicating pairs. Okay, uh, so, so if I rephrase what you say, you don't care about the code assigned uh, in each of man tree. What you right. are interested in is uh, what is the original node, uh, so one or two yeah. or three or four, etc., cetera, uh, in uh, the of man tree. And then uh, based on this alphabet, you built the union of the of man trees. Right, exactly. Okay. So for, from now on, we're only in, interested in the topological structure of the Huffman tree. Okay, okay. Okay, my, my, my uh, question was rather about the alphabet that you consider to build the union, uh, and yeah. th th but uh, this was the part uh, which right. was not to me. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So we 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 do all this for this uh, for the moment just to get um, the lower bound transferred from the Huffman tree to uh, distance in a network, because there are these classic results that in a Huffman tree, uh, if you have a distribution, then the the entropy of that distribution um is or uh, uh, to the basis of the number of letters that you have usually like delta is a two there so it's binary uh, we just do this to to get the um, the entropy lower bound transferred also for a lower bound for the traffic matrix exactly but maybe it become maybe i should start with uh, should have started with the upper bound because now um we do explode exploit that connection also to construct the network uh, and in order to match that bound here. So now uh, the expected route length, uh, depending on the traffic matrix, is at least uh, in the order of this entropy. But um, we can actually also show that um, the same idea also gives us an algorithm. Okay, so um, the algorithm will be as follows. We just keep what we just said in the lower bound. We, we build the optimal tree. And this we can do easily. This is... Um, this can be constructed like uh, greedily, such a tree. We do this tree for each of the of the rows. And then we take the union of those trees. We just take the union of the edges incident to each of the of the nodes that we have here. Um, but then we have to um, do something that um, we reduce the degree. Because it may be, as you said, that you, you're appearing in many of those uh, trees. So if you take the union, then some of the nodes may have a high degree that appear in many of these uh, trees. Um, so the, the challenge now is that can we reduce the degree of the network here without distorting the distances too much? Uh, because if you take the union, the distances will be great because it's all the optimal distances from the Huffman tree. But now we need to reduce the degree. How can we do that without um, changing the distances or without asymptotically um, changing the um, the expected root length that is still in the order of the ent conditional entropy if we take the union. And um, I just um, uh, have a partial answer to this uh, question so far. So that's one of the, the open problems there. Um, we have um, um, a result for sparse matrices here. 
So if the demand matrix is sparse, so it still has a lot of uh, entries that are zero, then um, what you can do is you can um, select a lot of nodes that don't have a high degree, right? So if the average, um, if the average degree of, uh, of a node is, is constant in the network, um, then needs to be constant in the end and is also constant in the demand, there will always be a constant fraction of nodes that have a degree not more than constant. So for example, here you have some nodes that have a high degree, for example, the node one, but on average um, in the demand, the degree is constant. So that means uh, there's always a set of uh, at least a constant fraction or half of the nodes that have at least um, at most a degree that is also constant. And um, now that the idea is that, okay, if you have some nodes that are um, that have a high degree, then um, you cannot um, connect them directly because in the end uh, you will violate the, this requirement that your your topology has a constant degree. So the idea there is that um, we use these additional nodes that must exist that have a low degree as helper nodes. So that goes a bit in the direction what what you asked before. Um, that um, you, we can exploit these nodes just to um, connect them as a proxy in these um, individual trees to reduce the, the degree of the nodes that otherwise would have a high degree. We just have a replacement. And since we have so many nodes that have a low degree in a sparse matrix, we have enough nodes that we can always compensate for those um, uh, nodes that have a high degree. So just um, to give you a, a bit a, a more concrete idea, um, our algorithm proceeds as follows. So if you have a demand matrix like that, that is, um, is um, sparse, so that if you, if you represent the demand matrix also as a graph, then, uh, and if the demand matrix is sparse, then the resulting graph is also sparse, right? Then, uh, however, you may have some nodes that have a high degree and that's not good. So what we do is we build for each of these um, nodes, we build a, a binary tree, a binary Huffman tree or a biased binary search tree. And then uh, some nodes may appear in a lot of these um, trees. Um, so now the, the, the role of the helper nodes um, is to replace some of these high degree nodes that appear in many of these trees as a proxy and connect the corresponding trees. And um, since there is at least the constant fraction of those nodes, uh, you always have enough of these nodes to, to do that. And, the distance is only increased by um, additive constant. So you just replace those high degree nodes with these uh, low degree nodes. And um, if you only have an additive difference in the distance, then the entropy bound asymptotically is still uh, the same, is still preserved. And, um, and that's how you um, can connect this echo tree construction so that um, the degree is reduced to constant and the entropy, conditional entropy lower bound is still preserved um, also here because the distance is added uh, only um, by two. But the problem is now that uh, this construction only works, of course, if we have these helper nodes and if the demand matrix is uh, sparse. And um, otherwise, we don't know. So the lower bound still holds, right? Because the lower bound is. Um, is general for any traffic matrix, but the upper bound to match that uh, lower bound, we only know it currently for this uh, sparse uh, example. Um, is, that, is that clear? So that's kind of the static, uh, static setting, how we manage to match this lower bound that we derived in, the, uh, in this context um, by exploiting the, the availability of these low degree nodes. But of course, much more interesting now to us is the dynamic setting. So because we also have these bursts in the traffic. So now the um, idea that, that I proposed to some extent is still useful in, in the dynamic setting. Um, and the one idea is, is the following. So now we have this uh, idea of these ego trees as we call it. So these optimized binary trees, half trees or binary search trees for each of these rows. And um, instead of using um, a static tree here, um, as in our static network design, um, you could also just use um, dynamic tree or a self-adjusting tree. 
So there is this uh, notion of splay trees, the self-adjusting uh, binary search trees, or you could also use something like a Huffman, uh, dynamic Huffman tree, because they already have the property that if these frequencies here change over time, then the, um, they automatically will also rearrange the vicinity of the nodes uh, to this source. And uh, however, you, you need, of course, also a mechanism that, um, that interconnects those trees in a, in the, um, in a way that you, you don't increase the cost uh, much. But um, actually, um, what we could show is that if you take any of these classic binary search trees that are self-adjusting and uh, interconnect them more or less the way I describe it, then the, the bounds or the guarantees you have on these uh, individual Huffman trees you can transfer them also to the whole network. Um, but now um, the, the model here, maybe I should I need to say one word about the model here, is that in order to inherit those properties, we need to assume that if you change a link, this is uh, the same cost as if you have um, a packet forwarding along a link. Okay, so in, in a model where, and this is the classic model you have in the, in the binary search trees that um, changing a link and forwarding um, along a link in, in a data structure, both of them cost one. And if you have the same cost model here, then the, um, the, all the, the properties, static optimality, dynamic optimality, um, all of these properties of online algorithms, you can transfer them also to the network, which is, is really nice, but it comes with this problem that um, yeah, we need to assume that link costs are relatively low, which in, in practice, changing a link is still more costly than, than forwarding a packet along that link. So that's one of the fronts where we're currently trying to see how we can generalize those models to do other link costs, uh, link change costs. But in principle, that the idea of this combining these trees is something that you can still use in an in a online setting. You can just replace this tree with an online tree. Um, and you can even to some extent um, use like concurrent data structures here. So if you want to make a distributed um, network that uh, like a fully decentralized peer-to-peer -peer type of network that um, self-adjusts to the demand. And that's more the, the classic model there in, um, in self-stabilization and, and so on. So then uh, you need to use some kind of distributed algorithm for this tree as well, right? So um, there are classic um, binary search trees uh, that support such concurrency. Uh, for example, something like CB trees. Uh, that's a, a data structure for um, binary search trees that are self-adjusting and it's also a concurrent data structure. And we are currently seeing how can we employ some of these concurrent um, uh, structures also in the context of, the, of these networks. Um, so it's roughly the, the concepts of these trees and how we use them in a different scenario, static, um, dynamic, and uh, uh, distributed. Is the idea clear? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Good. Uh, so there is a whole lot of uh, work to be done here. So in um, we wrote a little overview, uh, what are the dimensions here? Because once you start to think about, so we classified the, the problem space into different uh, dimensions here. So we are mostly interested in making networks demand aware. And um, for that, you, you um, either have a, oh, oops, you have a, a topology that is static or reconfigurable, statically optimized or reconfigurable. And um, if it's reconfigurable, you can think about um, what if the input is given offline? What if the input arrives over time? Maybe. In practice, it can still be interesting to study the offline problem because maybe in machine learning, the communication patterns um, are always the same or roughly the same. So you can predict more or less what will be the communication pattern ahead of time. So then um, it may be interesting to study offline algorithms for this problem, we have not done so. Now we have mainly focused on online and online there are different goals. Like you can have um, static uh, optimality that means your online algorithm is never worse than an algorithm that knows the distribution ahead of time and is um, optimized for that distribution. And your online algorithm doesn't know the distribution ahead of time, but it can adjust. But the static knows it, but it cannot adjust. If you are a constant approximation of this, in this scenario, then it's called static optimality. And dynamic optimality means that you are um, 
even constant competitive again, an offline algorithm that can adjust and even knows everything ahead of time. And that's the, that's the holy grail if, if you can do that basically. There are other properties uh, there. It's like, um, for example, working set properties that people are studying in the context of self uh, adjusting uh, binary search trees. The challenge here is that we don't today, there's an open conjecture, maybe you know that in online algorithms, we still don't know whether the splay tree that has been proposed is a dynamically optimal data structure. So today we still don't know even how to make a constant competitive self-adjusting tree, binary search tree. And um, so that, that's um, unfortunate because we want to build upon that. So we cannot inherit those properties. Good, I think um, I'm almost um, up with time. So um, maybe one remark here, very intriguing thing uh, uh, around this um, echo trees is that um, now I, I, so far I only talked about binary search trees to build them in Huffman trees. Um, in binary search trees, we don't know how to make this dynamic optimality, as I just mentioned, still an open conjecture, open problem. But if you are not insisting on the nodes to be sorted here, like you don't have to be a search tree, but it can be any tree, then you can be um, constant competitive. And uh, that, so you cannot do local routing, but you can be constant competitive. Good. Um, I think that's, that's it more or less um, on this demand or network. So it's relatively young field. Um, it has quite some potential, but it can only be good if the structure is uh, there. And we are still um, currently trying to find uh, the right metrics here. So entropy is just the first step. Maybe there are other metrics that we need there. And um, one big challenge maybe in this context, just to mention it is that um, of course, if you want to make networks demand where you need uh, to collect information, you need to compute the optimal solutions, et cetera, uh, centrally or decentralized way, but um, you need to make this in a scalable, scalable manner. You need scalable algorithms to adjust your network. And that's one of the key challenges, uh, practical also key challenges there, but also theoretically interesting challenges. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I think so. Is there any further question by the audience? Uh, I have a couple of questions, perhaps. If you, <clears throat> if uh, so, uh, <clears throat> the first one uh, is um, about the uh, optimization problem when you consider this. Um, um, linear combination of weighted costs. And uh, so this is, a, this is one formulation of the problem. Right. W what type of optimization uh, uh, problem uh, does it belong to in terms of classes? And uh, uh, what is the difficulty of uh, applying that? Uh, that's, that's a very uh, interesting question there. By, by the way, the other main metric that we consider there is congestion. And actually, we could show that some of the, if you optimize for the, the path length, you're also doing uh, quite some good for also optimizing the congestion goal. So the, the algorithms that are presented are fairly good with some additional tricks also for congestion. But um, um, regarding the, the complexity class, uh, as I mentioned very briefly, this, this problem is a little bit related to virtual network embedding. Because if you have a demand matrix, mm -hmm. you can think of it as like a graph, right? And if you have a, a physical network that you yes. want to build, let's say the physical network should be degree three, or let's say that the physical network should be degree two. Then I can tell you, um, I give you the, the physical network already. Uh, physical network degree two is just a set of, um, of circles or, or lines, right? Or a single line if it needs to be connected. Then um, if I give you the network, then this problem is already NP hard. Because if, if I ask you embed me this graph or this demand into a line, this is called the minimum linear arrangement problem. That's a classic optimization problem that is unfortunately NP hard. And um, it seems like now we are making the problem even harder because now I'm not giving you the physical network, but you can also optimize the physical network, right? And um, however, um then that's also an intriguing uh, component of this uh, thing, of this problem space here is that it's not clear to us currently whether this flexibility makes the problem easier or harder 
it's not that I can say um, if I know if I give if I've given a fixed network of, of degree three, and then the problem of optimally mapping the workload on this network uh, is NP hard doesn't mean that it's also NP hard if like I can design degree free network for this demand. I mean, there are even simple counter examples like if uh, if the degree if the degree free network if if the demand is also degree free network, then I can just build the network like the demand is and it's a trivial trivial uh, solution. Um, but if I have given another degree free network fixed, then actually embedding a degree free demand into the degree free uh, network is already NP hard. So it can also make things simpler in some cases. So the complexity, we understand some complexity results around it, but in general, um, we, we currently have, it could be that this problem even become faster to solve and easier to solve um, than in, in, a, in, a, in a static classics setting, if that was your question. You, you are asking about this complexity, right? Francois, you're still here? Well, okay, okay. Uh, Stefan, I, I have another question. I was intrigued by uh, your classification of uh, various uh, data sets into uh, structural classes. And uh, I was puzzled by the fact that the only data set that is very far from the other was the one that was generated uh, well by uh, humans uh, right. well i mean by uh, by a computer actually right and, uh, so it seems that uh, generated traces are have less structure yet uh, people make them in order to fine tune their uh, optimization mechanism but here it seems that uh, it would fail your test, no? It's a very good uh, point, actually. We are also a bit surprised by that because according to our, I mean, no, I, I think you're talking about this synthetic yes. trace up here, right, the P-fabric. Yes. Yes. In some sense, it has more structure uh, over time, but it has less structure uh, or it's not, yeah, it has actually less structure in terms of uh, non-temporal complexity. And uh, we were also a bit surprised because I mean, we are the first to look at this from, from this perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, indeed, it seems to uh, highlight that um, this model may not be exactly uh, matching the, the kind of workloads that uh, we see in other contexts, like in Facebook uh, data centers and so on. So um, that, that's actually a good point. We were actually thinking to, uh, to maybe raise this issue at, at some point, because I mean, depending on the methodology you apply, you of course will see um, new, you have a new perspective on these traces and you see differences that maybe people have not observed so far. Yeah, exactly, um, but just because they were not aware of it. So maybe it could help uh, in building better traffic generators. Right, exactly. So actually that's one of the, I think could be really interesting uh, direction also to go here to see how can we reproduce um, or how can we like make traffic generators that are more representative of the kind of workloads we see there? Mm -hmm. Because these are like more recent workloads. This is, has been used for quite some time. Uh, one reason, by the way, why this doesn't have a lot of temporal complexity is um, because here they use like Poisson arrivals of, uh, of packets. Sure. That's a, a typical model. And, and, and then it's like a virtual network embedding. And then it's, it still has some uh, structure because of the temporal of the virtual network embedding. So it's not like fully up here. So it still has some temporal structure, but real workloads have much more, it seems, um, um, structure there. So it's, it's um, um, uh, actually one of the directions we're currently um, thinking. And, and that, but there, my problem is if you think about these traffic generators, I'm, I'm never quite sure what is the goal of, of or what is the objective that you want to optimize the traffic generator for? Because of course I could give you a traffic generator that just reproduces these uh, clouds exactly by just replaying them or playing them in a reverse order or something like that. Will you already be happy with my traffic generator if I do that or you want to some have something more random? And in which sense should it be more random? And, um, and that's going a little bit in a, in, a, in, a, in a direction that I don't fully understand yet. On the one hand, you want to be different, right? Otherwise, it's trivial. But then in which direction should it be different? 
So that, that's actually something I'm still uh, pondering a bit uh, about. I, I don't quite know what we really want here. But, well, but if you look, if you simply look at the paper, what they want is realistic traces. Right. And, but if you don't have enough and you want to make a generator for realistic trace, then what is, how is realistic defined? It should not be exactly the ones. Hmm? So this is, I'm, I, I recently saw some of these papers doing the machine learning to, to reproduce traffic tracing in a, in a little bit a different way. And they're very different in some, uh, very similar in some dimensions. But then if you look at our matrix, maybe they will end up somewhere else. And then it, the question is, uh, if they need to be the yes, same uh, in, in every dimension, yes. oops, if they need to be the same in every dimension, oops. Yes. Oops. If they need, Stefan, we are losing oh. you. This and the connection get a little bit worse. So let me just turn off the oh, oh. camera here. Okay. Uh, uh, there are also questions you alluded to. I think uh, because uh, there is some echoes from your side. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, from my side, I have a, a, a first comment and then a few very short questions. Uh, in fact, uh, Stefan, uh, you, uh, maybe you don't know me. Uh, I started my uh, professional career as a researcher in optical networking 20 years ago. Ah. <laughs> so I was okay. a bit surprised with your first slide. And uh, so uh, just as a comment, at that time, we already have uh, optical switches, uh, at least... Uh, from uh, from the labs, mm -hmm. and, and I, I worked a lot with them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but at that time, it was the telecommunication bubble, and then there was no real markets, uh, big market for them. So uh, I uh, very surprised in a, in, in a good way that now that, that there may be some uh, additional possibilities uh, for for them uh, to apply what you what you what you are, you are doing. The first question I have is, uh, what is the uh, switching time you need? Uh, I think it is circuit, optical circuit switching time, but do you need a switching time in milliseconds, seconds? Uh, what is the, the right? Right. The, the, so, the right, yeah. Yeah, so right now from the data that we have, um, we know that uh, most likely if you can have faster reconfiguration times than uh, we currently consider then uh, you could uh, improve the, the network even further. So now um, it, it depends a bit on the context in, in a wide area network. Of, of course, you have these um, coarse granular trends that uh, in the morning you have a certain amount of traffic and then on an hourly basis, it changes um, uh, quite a bit and you, you can exploit that. But from what I hear also from the, the people at Microsoft, um, research that, that have even more fine-grained data that um, there are quite a bit of local uh, bursts or very short bursts that you could benefit if you if you have shorter reconfiguration times. Um, so currently the, the technology um, for a long time was more around some milliseconds. So you, you can change it within milliseconds. Yeah. But now it, like we are going like this year at uh, CCOM, there was a paper in the order of uh, nanoseconds. So it's slowly- but going nanosecond, we already had this time, this, ah, this okay. some technology 20 years ago, uh, using semiconductor optical amplifiers, for example. So right, it, but, it depends that this has some cost and some uh, also some constraints, uh, other constraints, if you want. Right. I mean, but one that, of uh, the- But it is possible, nanosecond is possible, but, and we were thinking about using that for optical packet switching at the time. Uh, and we were using in some labs, uh, but it was it, there were no products uh, from this. Uh, but for optical switching, we had at the time, uh, and we know uh, we still have bigger switches today with this kind of switching time of around a millisecond. But if millisecond is, is okay, uh, I think you can find uh, um, different pro uh, manufacturers producing uh, optical switching. This okay. sounds very interesting. So what was the, the key technology there you had there for the so, nanosecond so for, time? For nanosecond, it was mainly uh, semiconductor opti optical amplifiers. 
So it's a okay. kind of on-off switch. If you put the, 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 the power or switch on and off the power on, on the optical amplifier, it's yeah. not or let the, the or amplify the, the light. But you yeah. are coupling them with, uh, with uh, optical splitters and combiners, you can do switching. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I am a co-author of a paper which was using a one by eight at the time. It was in the year 2000, I think. Uh, it, it was a one by eight uh, that can be used. Uh, if you use many of them, you can build an eight by eight switch, for, for example. Very cool. Can you send me this uh, point? That, that was yeah, the, I, I, you, I can send it to you. To you. What were the kind that? of applications you, or what kind of type of networks you were considering it for? It was, it was for optical uh, networks, uh, for optical, uh, circuit, uh, uh, optical circuit networks, circuit switching. Uh, so it was for the millisecond time scale, but for the nanosecond, it was optical packet switching. Yeah, but for data centers mainly or for- uh, No, it was for optical network in general. Uh, yeah. We are not focusing at the time on uh, data centers. I mean, while but, for- But I have yeah. some colleagues, I have some colleagues in Bell Labs uh, working with this kind of technology uh, for uh, data centers. Sounds very cool. I mean, one thing to say here is that um, in the one of the, I mean, even if you have nanosecond reconfiguration time, of course, um, it may still be slower because you also have to make the decisions. You have to take the into account the actual traffic. So th th that that takes much more time than actually now. Re re yeah, but time what, what, we, what we are doing with them is really really, really uh, optical. Very good. Have you heard of Rotornet? Um, so that's a, I haven't mentioned it in the in the talk, but there is this technology that they are building there in uh, California that, um, that the reconfiguration time is really high, yeah, really uh, low and really fast, but um, it's not doing any like demand aware uh, reconfiguration or anything like that. But it's just rotating uh, in a, according to a fixed schedule. Um, oh yeah. Uh, oh, from, from, yeah, yeah, and that's actually nice because then you can. Uh, um, benefit from the dynamic topology, even though it's not demand aware, mm -hmm. because you just get this uh, regular direct connectivity. And, and if you have like uh, all to all traffic or something like that, you can, uh, they show that you can greatly uh, improve the throughput by just blindly going through this, um, uh, this sequence of matchings in, the, in their case. So if you have a point that's, um, that uh, that was actually quite interesting. Uh, I will send you some pointers about that. In, uh, and the last question I have: Do you plan to? Hey, but, uh, one, one question regarding this: So you, uh, you be given your experience, you believe in this more dynamic, uh, or were there some discussions at that time already that uh, what could be the use case there, or um, I wonder. Uh, what... uh, it, in fact, I worked this uh, on this uh, kind of technology uh, twenty years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I really changed the, 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 my uh, topic of research uh, yeah. many times in my career. Uh, because I I was what, what, what you are doing is quite, it, 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 uh, it talks to me, in fact. Uh, so it, it seems to be interesting, in fact. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, I need to, to, to look at more details to, to see uh, if, if it is interesting or not. What is uh, what would be required to, to say if it is inter really interesting or not? If to have a real traffic traces and check on these real traces, what we can gain, in fact. Yeah. And uh, the, the question, uh, the, the last question is: uh, Do you do you think to have some uh, lab experiments with optical switches to test this kind of on a smaller uh, on small uh, Networks, of course, but to, to test this, uh, the, the, your ideas. Yeah, actually, we started to build a, a reconfigurable rack where we can do some uh, basic prototyping and testing and uh, and so on. But we are still struggling a bit uh, because it's not like off the shelf that the plug and play kind of uh, technology for us. But uh, we have, we have some demonstrators of some basic um, concepts there. But the reconfiguration time, we don't manage to get the, the ones that are basically written on the on the on the package that we we bought basically. So it's still uh, we're still struggling a bit to get the SNR right and the, the layer two, um, the, the firmware. So it's it's not as easy as we hoped in the beginning. But um, and we talked to the people in California that that have actually some similar issues there. But um, that's definitely yeah. yeah. 
So we are we are building those those kind of things in I, I, I remembered uh, that uh, uh, in 2000 we were using uh, uh, optical switches from a new uh, company at the time, which is called Cercalo in Switzerland. And I checked; they are still alive. Ah, <laughs> because, well. uh, and their technology was quite good, but it was very small switches at the time. Now they are a bit bigger switches. But, yeah. Uh, and it's a bit expensive also. Yeah, there are different technologies. We currently use Polatis. Uh, if, you see, if you know a good company, let us know. We will currently yeah, use I will put, give you the pointers uh, because they are, I really like the, the, their technology at that time and they are still alive. It, yeah. it is based on what we call MEMS, in fact. Uh, so right. Small mirror yeah. uh, in, for integrated uh, switches. Yeah. But I will, I will send you an email. Uh, before the end of this week, uh, I, will, I, will, I think before, before the end of this day also. I have a meeting Thanks, after, that so will not, not be uh, just after. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, I think we are a little bit uh, over time with uh, the many questions that you got, Stefan. So, uh, well, thank Thanks you again. Enough. Thank you again for, uh, for accepting our invitation to the seminar. It was very interesting. Thanks a lot and hope to see you live sometime soon. Yes, well, we we all we all hope on the uh, yes. Until next time, well. <laughs> Bye, okay. Sebastian. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.